Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here again at uh, Hosanna Lutheran Church, Little Palms Preschool, as we uh, gather again for this time of worship. It's uh, great that you can join us by this uh, electronic means, and uh, I appreciate all the notes. I've gotten uh, a number of notes from folks uh, sharing with me where you tune in from and, and what you think uh, of the uh, what we're providing so far, and uh, if you have anything going on, or if there's anything I might be able to, to uh, help you with, certainly let me know. A uh, lot of things happening around here as we're kind of uh, well underway again. The new school year is off and running and, and doing terrific so far, and uh, uh, we've started our Wednesday in the Word uh, ministry again, which includes right now a uh, confirmation class from 4 to 5.30. We have a meal for everybody from 5.30 to 6, and then from 6 to 7.30, I've been uh, teaching Lutheranism 101, which is kind of our new member class or the adult confirmation, uh, kind of a catechetical review class. Uh, you're sure welcome to come and join us for that if you'd like. Uh, Pastor Peter Spalick is also teaching, he's got uh, Second Thessalonians that they're working their way through. And then uh, DCE Annie Anderson, our, our Director of Youth and Family Ministry, she works with the high school youth group on uh, uh, Wednesday nights, and we also have a, a couple of ladies that are just providing child care for anybody that's like junior high on down uh, to the preschool kids and other things too. So if any of the parents out there would like to be able to attend things, child care is available. Uh, September 15th, Pastor Nick and Paul Steinbart are going to partner together, and they're going to be teaching a uh, the series uh, Financial Peace University, and we'd really love to uh, have folks join in on that. It's a great program. Dave Ramsey and his whole team developed it. It's just a tremendous program. A lot of people have really benefited greatly from sharpening skills and learning a lot about financial management and planning and debt reduction and all kinds of things. Uh, and so if you could benefit from that or if you know somebody who could really benefit from that, please uh, get them tuned in. That will begin uh, in mid-September and it runs to mid-November. It's about a nine-week uh, series. So we would love to have some people uh, come for that. And as I mentioned, free child care is available. So if you've got young, young folks, young parents that have children, uh, there is child care available for that entire time. So love to have you come and join us. We've got other things happening. Thursday morning Bible studies back underway, our, our Sunday morning Bible studies underway, and uh, the ASU uh, campus is gearing up and about to get started, so our, our international student ministry and our domestic student ministry, both of them uh, out there at the campus at ASU, are, are really in to full swing at this point. We'll ramp up even more so as the, the students are coming to campus right now and, and starting to really populate that place. So all kinds of things going on, just a ton of stuff happening. We would love to have you come and join us and be a part of things. If there's anything we can do for, for you uh, from whatever distance we might be at right now, certainly let us know. Well, with all of that in mind, why don't we go ahead and, and we'll turn our attention to the Lord. We'll call upon his name, confess our sins before him, and lift some songs of praise to him as well. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We pray this prayer of confession together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. And for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen indeed. And long before we ever thought to pray such a prayer, confessing our sins before God, God had already answered our prayer by sending forth his Son in mortal flesh and blood to bear our sins and to be our Savior. Jesus Christ, the heaven-sent Savior, he came into this world, he lived out the perfect life that we could not live. And then he who was without sin became sin for us. He took all of our sins upon himself when he gave himself in sacrifice upon the cross. On the third day, he rose up victorious over even death in the grave. So because of all that Jesus Christ has done for you, as he has atoned for your sins and conquered even death in the grave and the power of the devil, because of all that Christ has done for you, I want you to know that your sins are forgiven, your life is made new, your hope springs eternal, and heaven is your home. 
live this new life, forgiven, redeemed, and restored to God's family. Live this new life to the good and glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen indeed. Let's lift our voices in a song of praise for him. A couple of scripture readings I want to share with you now. The first reading is from Ephesians chapter 4. This is a moment when uh, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, has already been um, uh, sharing a, a lot of deep, rich, wonderful theology and, and making sure we recognize our identity as, as the redeemed children of God. Uh, chapter 2, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, that speaks about how we were dead in transgressions and sins in which we used to live. 
when we follow the ways of this world. But God in His great love and mercy, He has redeemed us and raised us up in new life through Christ. And it's got that beautiful summary of the the Christian life and faith. It says that uh, uh, it is by grace you have been saved, not by works so that no one can boast. It's the gift of God. Uh, We are saved by grace through faith. And then he goes on to say, uh, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As a great term for us, he said, we are, we are God's workmanship. It's a Greek word that can be translated as, uh, as uh, we are his uh, product. Even, you can even translate it to say we are his masterpiece. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's got a lot more rich theology in the Bible, in in his letter to the Ephesians as well. But here in chapter 4, he really wants to get to the fact that we are called together to be engaged in the mission, to be working as one, united together as one in Christ, and that we are to be working toward the the goals of of the same mission together. Here's what he says. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the spirit, uh, the unity of the spirit, through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it said, when he ascended on high, he took many captives in his train and gave gifts to his people. Christ has given gifts to his people. And then it goes on to say, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then he will no long, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will, we will in all things grow up in him who is the head, that is, Christ. And from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Each part is called upon to do their work. Each part has an important part to play so that together the body of Christ may be built up. Jesus kind of uh, reminds us of that in this parable that he teaches. In Matthew chapter 25, he's taught some parables in a row. One about the, the ten virgins at, a, at a, uh, uh, a wedding feast as they're waiting and anticipating the coming of the bride, when, uh, of the groom, when he would finally arrive. So they're, uh, they're urged to keep watch, diligently pay attention, and anticipate the arrival of the, of the groom, which would be Christ. The next parable is about the, uh, the, the workers to whom uh, the master has entrusted various talents, ten talents, five talents, and one talent, and they're supposed to be you know, putting these things to use, and two of them do. One of them buries his talent, doesn't do anything with it at all. And when the king returns, he gives great rewards to those who faithfully did something with what was entrusted to their stewardship, and then he brings punishment and condemnation upon the one who did nothing. Well, then the very next parable is this parable. It's a picture of judgment day. It's a a time when he'll speak about a separation, sheep and goats, believers, rejectors, and and the consequences that come. But listen to what he says and how he sort of identifies the two categories. So he says this, 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see, the, see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray a moment. Gracious Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, bless the words and the message and make them yours. Let your spirit speak and do not let me be the stumbling block between you and your people. I would pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen indeed. I want to share a story that I uh, read uh, just recently or earlier this week. Uh, it's a true story. It was a 
uh, a man who uh, was recounting a day back in elementary school when he finally uh, had some hopes and dreams that were in front of him. You see, he had finally reached the, uh, uh, the fourth grade, and this uh, young man at the time called Bobby, uh, Bobby knew that the, the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade together, they would put together a school play, and so he was excited to finally have a chance to be a part of that. And, and that particular year, they were going to present the play Peter Pan, thought, wow, what a great opportunity. He would love to be Peter Pan. He wanted to go out and audition for Peter Pan. I mean, just imagine, first of all, the play itself is called Peter Pan. So who's going to be the center, uh, at the center stage in the spotlight? Who's going to have all the speaking parts? Who's the one who gets to engage in sword play and fly around, even if it's only on a cable or something? You get to fly, man. This would be fantastic. And so he set his sights on, uh, on gaining the part of Peter Pan. That's what I'm going to do. And he went and he auditioned and all the other kids auditioned and the uh, the music director at the school was the one. She was going to be the one who would uh, direct the play. And so they all came. And, you know, he was a little nervous about the, the singing and the dancing. There was a lot to the whole kind of uh, part that he was uh, really hoping for. But, you know, for the sake of playing Peter Pan, for the sake of getting to fly and be the guy at center stage, he thought, uh, I'll put up with a little singing and dancing. I'll put my best effort out there, and so he did. In his audition and all the other kids, they all auditioned and, and um, uh, were anticipating the assignment of the parts. Well, a few days later, finally things were ready, and they were all anticipating, and finally she, she posted the list of assigned parts outside of her door in the hallway, and all the kids came and started gathering in around to see where are they at, and, and he saw Peter Pan, uh, Ah, somebody else got Peter Pan, some sixth grader. I don't know who that is. He was thinking, well, maybe, maybe I could be Captain Hook or just one of the lost boys or something. Those would all be great parts too. And so he sort of keeps reading his way down through the list. I didn't get any of those parts either until finally he sees his name. And what's the part that he's assigned? Tree number four. Tree number four. Uh, he didn't get Peter Pan, wasn't Captain Hook. He's not one of the lost boys. He's not, he's not even tree number one. <laughs> There's one, two, and three ahead of him. He's the fourth tree in the forest. Tree number four. And he thought tree number four, he doesn't have any speaking parts. There's no... There's no center stage for tree number four. There will not be any applause or accolades or a, uh, there won't be any flowers tossed on stage or anything like that for somebody called tree number four. Probably not going to get any sort of accolades or hear any applause for himself really at all. Tree number four that doesn't sound very impressive or important. And he could have actually thrown a fit. He could have just been dis disappointed and, 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 and felt sorry for himself. He could have just stomped off in anger and said, well, if I'm not going to be Peter Pan, then I'm not going to be anybody at all. He could have done that, but he didn't. I mean, he was a sensible kid for a fourth grader, and he kind of realized, well, you know, all the main parts did kind of go to the sixth graders who have already put in some time when they were fourth and fifth. <laughs> so the best parts go to the older kids, and they've kind of, you know, uh, put in their time and earned their positions and their opportunities. And, and so he thought, well, at least I'm a part of the cast. I'm on the stage. I can be, I can have a part to play. And so he sort of willingly, and, and as it turned out, even joyfully went about being tree number four. And what he learned was, well, he was pretty well equipped for what tree number four needed to do already. I mean, there was actually one song and dance kind of routine that the trees of the forest would do. And so he learned that part. And most of the time, his job was to be there as the tree and have your branches out. And once in a while, you ruffle the, the leaves. <laughs> and that was pretty much it. You got to just sort of be there and play your own part. And, you know, what he learned was had there not been tree number four, it wouldn't have been much of a forest. And if there was no forest, then where was Peter Pan and all the lost boys? Where would they fly? That's where they flew, was in and around the, the forest. They needed other people on stage just to help them present their parts of the play as well. 
And as he uh, came to understand, you know, when you get together to put together a production, there's an awful lot that goes into it. And actually, all the rehearsals, they had a good time, and they were uh, joking and, and, and developing their friendships. And, and they also learned some skills together. They, they figured out how to design and then build what would be the set and, and the, uh, the, the island and the, and the pirate ship and all those pieces to the puzzle. They figured out how to paint things and have fun together. And then, and then when it did come opening night, they all had their costumes ready and they were ready to go and they, they really just had a great time when they all worked together, when everybody in the cast was working together and playing their part and, and, and contributing to the overall message. Well, that's when the whole presentation, that's when the whole message, that's when the whole production really came together to have its, its impact on the people who came to see and hear. When they all worked together, the whole thing came together. And then it was what it was really meant to be in the first place. As it turned out, he was really pretty happy just being tree number four. And I wonder, what about you? Would you be content being tree number four? You see, sometimes I think in life we... Uh, we find ourselves with an overinflated ego that thinks, no, I really want to be the one at center stage. I need to be in the spotlight. I want to be the one who hears the applause and receives the accolades and, and, and the one to whom the flowers are thrown. I want to be that one right there in the center of the whole stage. I want, I want everything to revolve around me. That's what the sinful, overinflated ego tends to desire. Or we at least you know, want to make sure that the world around us knows that we are important, that we are significant. I mean, the world in which we live, it's really tried to condition us to, to try to present some sort of a front out there like, man, I, I, I want to make sure that you all know that I am important. I've got a position of power. I've got the, all, all the collection of toys. I've got all the right things. Everything is perfect. And in fact, we sort of present it that way more and more, it seems, even through social media. Have you ever noticed that? You know, there's actually a, a diagnosable condition that's called Facebook syndrome. That's true. And Facebook syndrome is a sort of depression that sets in when you look at everybody else's life out there and you begin to think that your life is inferior, that it's broken, that it's somehow less significant than the others. What do you see on Facebook? Everybody puts their best face out there. You put it out there on social media. Oh, this is the happiness and the joy and the fun that we have. And, uh, and look at this uh, baby who's growing. I love seeing those things. Don't get me wrong. Uh, here's the baby who's growing, and here's the experience that I've had, and my life is magnificent. That's how it comes across. And the Facebook condition is that people see everybody else has got the perfect life, adventurous and blessed, and their children are perfect, and they don't have any problems at all because you never see, you know, behind the curtain. But you know what's behind your own curtain. And you start to look around your own life and you think, well, but my family is flawed. It's broken. My career path is not as stellar. Uh, my collection of toys is not as impressive. My square footage is less. My bank account is less. And, and by all those earthly measurements, we begin to think that our life is less. And we begin to think that maybe we're just relegated to being nothing more than tree number four. There's one more tree in the forest Sometimes we look at that position as if it's a punishment, it's an embarrassment, it's a disgrace, when it's not. It's not at all. Actually being tree number four is one of the greatest blessings and honors you can ever have. Now yes, in our own lives, by the way, we experience the brokenness in families and you know, disappointments and career paths don't always uh, launch the way we think that they should or we dream that they would. And sometimes there are trials and challenges and we find ourselves mired in grief, in heartache and brokenness and disappointment, sometimes carrying around a bag full of bricks called disappointment and bitterness and anger and resentment and all those kinds of things. Yeah, sometimes we find ourselves weighed down by those things because it's a sinful, fallen, broken world. We're sinful, fallen, broken people. But let me tell you something, a little secret. When you see all those perfect lives out there on Facebook, 
They got their own curtain to hide behind too. And they also experienced the same kinds of things. Why? Same fallen, broken world. But God has an amazing approach for us to life in this world. He calls us to be part of the cast. He calls us into the storyline. He calls upon us to each contribute to the good of one another so that one another can be built up and find comfort and hope or redirection or guidance or mercy or grace forgiveness or healing. There are so many things that God calls upon us to share with one another. That's why he, he collects us together, he gathers us together, he calls us together as the body of Christ, as the church, as his family of the faithful, so that we can minister to one another in his name. And here's the thing, he doesn't call everyone to be the one at center stage, to be in the spotlight, to be the one who's got all the singing and the dancing and the spoken lines. He doesn't call any of us to really be the star of the show because quite frankly, the star of the show is Jesus himself. He is the only one. He is the one who stands at center stage and it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. That's what he has called us to recognize, that, that we are all supporting players in this, in this production, in this message that he wants us to share and convey and, and carry out there into the world. And so it's not the grand things. He doesn't call us to grand works of, of achievement as if we're, we're somehow supposed to measure the value of our life by how many Nobel Peace Prizes we might win or how many times did we absolutely transform the world. As a preacher, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, would my life be better if I could fill up football stadiums full of people to come and hear? It wouldn't be about me. You know, Billy Graham used to fill up the football stadiums, but it wasn't Billy Graham that it was all about. He was really skilled at preaching of Jesus, sharing Jesus, bringing people to Jesus. That's the one. He's the star at center stage. And the rest of us, we all have parts to play. And some parts maybe are more visible and some parts less visible. All parts are significant. And in fact, I wonder if you realize just how valuable tree number four really is. <laughs> a little Bobby in the fourth grade, he came to figure out just how valuable tree number four really is. He was, he was comfortable, it was easy, he knew the part, they really just had to learn the one song and dance routine. And uh, he really just, his job was to stand there and periodically wave the leaves, rustle the leaves, and and be there to support the entire production and all of the parts that were being played. Tree number four is a critically important part, and sometimes it seems so insignificant in our eyes, but, but just imagine the impact of those who are tree number four. Do you know who tree number four is in the world around us? Tree number four is that young mom who sits at her child's bedside in the quiet of the night, and she teaches that child a beautiful bedtime prayer. It's just the two of them outside of the spotlight and center stage, but she teaches that child a bedtime prayer, and that bedtime prayer finds its home in that child's heart and soul and becomes something that they recite to Jesus himself for the rest of their lives. That was tree number four. Tree number four is that that husband who knows that his calling in life is to love his wife, to love this gift that God himself has, has given him, to love her, but not only just for her sake, but because he is teaching those children they've been blessed with. He is teaching them what it looks like for a man to love a woman as a gift and a treasure from God. That is tree number four. Those children, they, they grow up learning this is the model of what love really looks like, and that's the kind of gift and blessing I dream of in my own life too. That was tree number four, living out faith in a quiet, purposeful, intentional way. 
tree number four is that one who steps up and finds places to kind of volunteer and be a part of the body of Christ. And maybe it's not out there on center stage. Tree number four sometimes is just that church cleaning team that, that knows that sometime during the week while this room is empty, somebody needs to get in there with a vacuum and just kind of get things ready because next Sunday we're going to come back together again. Tree number four is that, that person who volunteers in a preschool classroom and just shares uh, books and, and, and tells stories to the children that, uh, that stimulate their imagination and help them learn a little something more about the love of Jesus. Tree number four is that, that preschool teacher who gets up and comes, even though she's, she's tired and she really could use a little bit of a break, but she knows there's some great gifts from God that are going to gather at her feet right there in her classroom, and she gets to help them learn and grow. That's tree number four. Uh, tree number four is, is that person who just knows that one of their gifts is the ability to cook a meal, and, and we've got an international student ministry at Arizona State University, and on Thursday night they need somebody who will cook a meal for a hundred people. And they're not going to stand in the spotlight. They might not even be there to serve the meal. They're just going to cook the meal and deliver the meal, and then they're going to step off stage, and the people will come. You see, that meal becomes the thing for which a 100 international students come so they can be fed in the body. And while they're there, there's a whole team of missionaries and volunteers and people who just have English development conversation with them, and they tell them the story of Jesus. And those people receive the bread of life. None of that would have happened if it hadn't been for tree number four who said, I can cook that meal and give those students reason to come. Tree number four is that, that guy who sits down with the, uh, the domestic student ministry out there to lead a Bible study and teach those American students as well, a little something more about Jesus while they're on a college campus in the midst of a world that is desperately trying to drag them away from their faith. Tree number four shows up in so many ways in, in the, the simple gestures, in the kind words, in the loving actions. Tree number four, uh, that's that group of people that Jesus was talking about in that, that parable that, he had, that greets us today. You remember that parable? And Jesus talked about Judgment Day, and on Judgment Day there's going to be a separation, the sheep and the goats, the believers and the rejectors. And, and he's going to identify them by what he has seen going on in their lives. He says uh, to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take the inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And those very people said, when did we do those things, Lord? When did we ever, I mean, they know that they did those things for people around them, but when did we do those things for you, Jesus? And the king says, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. You were doing these things for me. You were just living out your faith. Your faith uh, expresses itself in gratitude and in works of service. You know, sometimes we, we like to wrestle with this strange question in our, in our world. We, we kind of wonder, what's the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? We uh, dream about it like it's some great philosophical thing. And, and, and the devil wants to convince us, oh, the purpose of life is to, is to build up your own name. It's to build your own kingdom. It's to climb up the corporate ladder. It's to surround yourself with all the perfect people that don't have a curtain behind them. It's supposed to be, uh, you know, it's about you uh, filling up your life with all the toys that you think you need, or, or, or gaining the square footage, or whatever else it is. Social status and prestige and power and authority, oh, that's the meaning of life. And those things are all the lie of the devil. You know, throughout the Gospels, Jesus actually tells us what the, the purpose of life is, the value of life. He tells us several times. In fact, uh, I've been studying my way through Mark and sharing that on a Sunday morning Bible study. And Several times now we've seen that the disciples begin to argue among themselves about which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> which one of us do you think gets to stand at center stage in the spotlight and hear all the accolades and the applause and the flowers are thrown? Which one of us will be the greatest? And Jesus always stops them. 
and he gathers them. And every time he puts a child in front of them, a little child, and he says, that's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then he always says this, if you want to be first, you have to be last. If you want to be the greatest, you have to be the servant of all. Over and over, Jesus says, the value of life is measured on your servanthood. Did you make a difference to somebody? Were you important to somebody? Did you teach them the bedtime prayer? Did you show them what it is for a man to love a woman? Did you uh, teach the children just how much you valued them? Are, are you concerned about people who are hungry and thirsty and in need? Servanthood is the value of life. That's the commodity by which Jesus measures the value of our very lives. Servanthood. He didn't call us all to be out there on center stage. He said the greatest one on the stage is tree number four. The Apostle Paul kind of reiterates that in this Ephesians reading when he says, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and, and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. He measured out the grace and the gifts that we each have, the time, talents, and treasures, and whatever it is that he calls upon us to steward on his behalf. He goes on to say, it was he, it was Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service, to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. He calls upon us to build one another up so that the body of Christ, the church, can be built up in unity, in the spirit of peace, in partnership. He says, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The whole body is built up around him who is the head, that's Christ. He's at center stage. He's the leading role. He's the one in the spotlight. He is the one who receives the praise and the thanksgiving, the applause and the accolades. It is to him we throw the flowers on opening night. And the rest of us, we're all in the cast. You remember what little fourth grade Bobby had, had learned when he said, I'm going to just go ahead and joyfully play tree number four. And he turned out to be one of the best tree number four that the world has ever seen. And he had a ball. He said, I'm a part of the cast. I get to be in the, in the mix of it all. And, and when I do my part, the other people can carry out their part and, and we'll have fun and, and we'll partner together and we'll create these beautiful sets and we'll carry this out. You know what we'll do? We will deliver the most beautiful, wonderful message to the people who come. That's us. Guess what? You have a part to play. Tree number four. It is perhaps one of the most important parts on the entire stage. Okay, tree number four. You raise your hands. You rustle the leaves. You teach them the prayer. You show them how to love. You show people what servanthood really does mean. You make a difference to the people around you. You carry out all the work that God has given you to do for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. And together, when all the parts carry out their work together, what a beautiful show. What a powerful message. Be tree number four for the good and the glory of Christ himself.
in his name. Amen. Amen indeed. May the peace of Christ which surpasses all of our understanding keep our hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord until that day when he receives us home. Amen. Folks, let's lift another song of praise and thanksgiving before him. let's pray. We pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and, and for all people according to their needs. In the prayers of the church today especially, we, we uh, continue to lift up Dorothy Peterson and Doris Stanky who have each uh, uh, come under hospice care and uh, all indication is that, that uh, the Lord is preparing to receive them to his eternal home and the perfect health that he holds in store. We ask God to give them and those who keep vigil with them peace and comfort and that eternal hope that uh, Christ won for us. Uh, we also continue to pray for our preschool. It's, uh, it's now uh, underway. We've got two weeks of the school year already under our belt, and, and the place is busy and hopping and filling up, and we've got a few spots left to fill, so we're going to ask God to continue to do that until we are really at capacity. We ask God also to be at work in the hearts of our high school youth group. Our high school youth group has come back together. They've begun to meet. They are preparing to uh, get into a very busy year of fundraising, by the way. And if you can help them out, please do so. Uh, they're going to be doing a lot of fundraising events and activities because they're trying to raise enough money so that the entire group and their chaperones can go to the National Youth Gathering, which will happen in Houston, Texas next summer. 
So let's help these kids out. They've got, uh, they're a great bunch of kids, and, and they're, the youth gatherings are always just an amazing, uh, powerful, spiritually impacting experience for, for these high school kids. I see it every time. Uh, let's make sure that we can get these kids going and get them to the national gathering. It's going to be an amazing experience for them. Uh, we also pray for all the various ministries that are in action now, that, that God will work in, in your hearts and, and lives and, and draw people in. And uh, Many of those things you can attend in person. Many of them also do have Zoom options, online options, so you can connect that way as well. Uh, so we ask God to continue to be at work in all of those things. And for our ASU ministry, both the domestic student ministry, which Pastor Peter Spallett kind of uh, works on and spearheads, and the international student ministry, which Sharon Owen, uh, Owens also uh, spearheads, and we're connecting those two ministries together in, in many ways as well. So let's ask God to continue to pour out his blessing and wisdom and guidance and, and let his spirit move in the hearts of those kids. Let's pray. Gracious God, our heavenly, heavenly Father, we give you thanks for blessing us with the opportunity to gather in such a way here, to gather in your name and to gather around your holy word and to, and to let you continue to shape our lives in Christ. Lord, we give you thanks that you sent Jesus in mortal flesh and blood to bear our sin and to be our Savior, to make us new, to uh, win us for your own family. And what an overwhelming invitation you give us, and we joyfully answer as we come into your presence, as we call upon your name, and we ask, O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Gracious God, we love seeing the way you are moving and at work in so many ways in and through your people at Hosanna and Little Palms Preschool and at work in our neighborhood. And continue to pour out your spirit upon us. Give us wisdom and blessing and guidance, O oh gracious God, as we continue to try to bring Jesus into so many hearts and lives. We thank you, Lord, for the way the preschool is, is operating and is so filled with joy and excitement so far. And we do have just a, a few spots left, and we ask you, Lord, to, to draw those families in and to fill us up to capacity so that we can share the good news of Jesus with as many children and their families as possible. As we do so, Lord, let those efforts be fruitful for your name's sake. And as we get into the next few weeks and months, Lord, we pray, be at work in the hearts and lives of our high school students who are facing so many challenges to their face in this broken, fallen world that has become so hostile toward you and toward that faith that you work within them. Give them the armor of God and give them strength and wisdom and, and be at work through uh, Annie Anderson and through the other staff and volunteers who are working in their lives and through their own parents as well. Give them strength to face this world faithfully holding on to Christ. Lord, be at work in the, in the ministries we have going on out at Arizona State University uh, through Peter Spalick and Sharon Owens. Lord, we pray, continue to give wisdom, strength, energy, and joy as we reach out to more and more of those college students. They face quite a devastating world when it comes to faith development we ask you, Lord, to be their shield and defender. Work in the hearts and souls of the, of the people. Uh, let that gospel find its home there. And bless us, Lord, that we might be tree number four in whatever way you need us to be, in whatever way you call upon us to be. Let us joyfully and courageously step forward and say, here am I, Lord, send me. What can I do? Help each one of us to find our place of service and servanthood in your kingdom so that our lives may indeed have the value to them that you have in mind for us. And as we do so, Lord, bless our efforts and make, make our efforts fruitful for the sake of your kingdom and for the sake of your name. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, there are many among us who are suffering from brokenness in the body, illness or injury in so many ways. And we ask you to bring healing and strength as only you can. And provide the medical teams and resources and, and healing and hope for the people that we name before you in our hearts right now. Help them to fix their eyes on Jesus in the midst of all adversity. And Lord, by all appearance, Dorothy and Doris seem to be closing in on that moment when you'll receive them home and bless them with that perfect eternal health. 
We ask you, Lord, to continue to strengthen them and, and hold them steadfast in the faith and let them be beacons of light to the people around. And in your good time, receive them gently home to yourself. Bless those whose hearts are broken and, and, and held in grief. As we now remember that indeed you have a day of reunion to come in your own good time. Keep us also steadfast in the faith and proclaiming this good news so that one day more and more may be gathered with us there on that beautiful shore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy and grace as you've made it known to us through Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen indeed. And I continue to invite you, be in contact with us, and please let us know anything that we can be doing for you. And especially if you are somewhere locally here and, and would like us to bring communion to you or any other kind of spiritual care, we would be happy to do so. Uh, just let us know what, what we can be doing for you. And in the meantime, receive the blessing God gave to his priesthood to pray over his people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Amen indeed. And as we prepare to lift our voices again in a closing song of praise before the Lord, I, I urge you to continue to find ways to just be tree number four and live out your faith in, in the simple ways, the kind words, simple gestures, in love, mercy, and grace. Let's live it out together. We'll sing praise to him now and then go in God's peace for we are his children. Amen.